Hello and welcome to our book club. I just finished another great book. This is a book on Georges Méliès, uh, the long lost autobiography of Georges Méliès, which uh, is Georges Méliès in his own words. Uh, and it's a book compiled by John Spiro with some interviews uh, from him with some other filmmakers. Uh, before I get into this book, I just want to say this is a book that was made and funded through Kickstarter, through somebody who's passionate about magic and film, mostly film, I would say. <laughs> uh, but the history of magic is very much tied to the history of film, especially the beginning of film. Uh, and even today, it's not that far off. So definitely something you should look up and support if you can. Uh, I believe they have these for sale. I think they're just fulfilling distribution, but definitely check it out if you haven't heard about it. And if you don't know who George Melier is uh, and you don't recognize this image, we'll, we'll get right into it. Um, this book, let, let's talk about George Melier. George Melier was a filmmaker in the 1800s he wanted to make movies after seeing the magic of film uh, by the Lumiere brothers and others. He tried to purchase a camera. He couldn't purchase it. It's believed that he bought his first camera from David Devant, the famous British magician. And from there, he made films. Uh, now, filmmaking back in those days was a lot different than filmmaking nowadays. Right now, making this, I literally just prop my my camera up on a shelf and I clicked a button on my camera. Uh, filmmaking back then was ridiculously difficult. You had to spend an enormous amount of money to buy the film, to buy the chemicals. Uh, even even the reels of film, uh, they did not have, uh, you know, you have film that is rolled on a track. I don't know the proper technical terms, but it's rolled and uh, the film has holes in the side, like, you know, like a little wheel. So uh, it can be engaged when it's being rolled around in its little uh, canister. That was not even on the film back then. So people literally had to make those holes by hand, uh, you know, spacing those holes out uh, so that it's, you know, perfectly wound and unwound. This was a ridiculous um, process. And we hear about the process of filmmaking back in those days, how it took literally days to shoot a scene and scenes back then were only a few seconds long uh, they were only a few seconds long they couldn't shoot indoors they needed light and so almost all the shooting was done outside and the film had to be cranked at different speeds depending on the lighting conditions so you know today's a cloudy day uh, depending on the lighting conditions, when the clouds were moving in and out and it was going from morning to evening as we were shooting a scene, they had to crank it out at different speeds. And just the whole, and they had to, like literally everybody involved in the process had to know what they were doing. It, it cost a lot of money. Uh, George Melier making these films uh, through one of, uh, through one of his, experiences filming you know documentary style uh, thing he was filming I believe it was a scene in the streets of Paris or, or London just you know testing out the camera uh, doing a documentary style filming of street uh, there was a glitch a glitch there was a technical error with the camera and so when he was checking out the film uh, he saw that a bus turned into a hearse or a, or a carriage. I, I forget exactly what, but it was a transformative thing happening on film because of that glitch. Uh, and this is what led to this experimentation of creating special effects through film. Uh, if you watch George, 
you know, if you haven't seen George Melier's films, look it up on YouTube. Uh, he made hundreds of films in his lifetime. Most of them were destroyed. Uh, we can get into that later. But you can see some of them that have been beautifully restored today. You can find most of them on YouTube. Uh, he also put them out in a collection. I have a, uh, I have a collection of his DVDs I bought in Spain. Uh, they released, I believe, back in 2011, uh, The First Wizard of the Cinema. And it's a collection of a lot of his films, the restorations of them anyways. Just a beautiful, and with commentary and all that stuff. Uh, but when you look at the films that they were making, they were doing special effects. George Melier, who was this pioneer, of doing special effects, uh, just cutting, superimposing, uh, and splitting films, splitting films. So you'd have two actors, uh, or you know, one actor who's filming himself, doing a scene with himself. George Melier would film himself, and he'd be enacting a scene with his uh, doppelganger. It wasn't like today where we can time it out and everything. The actors had to literally time everything out rehearse it they can't see a preview of the film they have to rehearse everything out do it on film and then react to that when they refilm it and then you know cut it together uh and they couldn't you know they couldn't stretch the film they couldn't slow it down they had to time things out perfectly nowadays if you're doing something like that and you know you open up uh, some sort of movie maker or Premiere Pro, you can literally slow things down. You can cut things. You you can match things up. Uh, it's a lot easier today. To, to say it's a lot easier today is <laughs> is not even a statement that you can fairly make. I mean, it's possible today. It wasn't possible back then with the technology that they had. Uh, these guys were really. Uh, pioneers. One of the things that I found fascinating, you read this in the, the old books, is some of these uh, were just so popular, some of these films, and they were played in theaters, and very short. A train pulling into a station, and everybody going crazy, oh wow, this is so, you know, oh, the train, you know, maybe the train's coming into the cinema, people freaking out in the theater. Um, this was a very new technology. It's hard to imagine the impact that it had on people. Uh, we're so used to film, we're so used to screens, it's really hard to imagine the impact, but that's the impact that it had on people. And apparently people would just look at, you know, they had documentary films, shooting on a street corner, shooting the ocean, you know, just filming the ocean, nothing. No drone shot, no, <laughs> you know, n nothing crazy. Just a, a immobile camera in one direction and it's shooting a scene. It's shooting the ocean. It's shooting a waterfall. It's shooting a street corner. And it's doing it for a few seconds. And people would look at this and wonder, and the people who had never seen the ocean or they've never seen that city, I was like, wow, so this is what it's like. Uh, just an incredible thing that we were able to do with technology as humans and share those experiences. And it was also apparently amazing for the people who were familiar with those scenes. If somebody, you know, uh, lived near the ocean, they would be like, yeah, wow, that's amazing. Uh, the film is capturing what we actually see in real life. Like, this was really cool for them. It's really hard to understand nowadays because we're so... Uh, technologically advanced so uh, this these movies and this experimentation that Melies did which was amazing he captured a lot of stuff a lot of magicians he captured as well some of them recorded some of them lost unfortunately some of them lost uh, he filmed David Devant which is lost he filmed um, he filmed the Davenport brothers doing their cabinet act which is also lost. And these are like, you know, this is the end of the 19th century. This is the 1890s uh, that he's filming this stuff in, in the early 1900s, like literally 1900. Uh, 
it's remarkable to think that they had, you know, I read about these guys. I have their books. I read about them. And I didn't even know that they were ever captured on film. You see photographs of them, uh, you read about them, but then knowing, wow, somebody actually set up a camera, they filmed them. Uh, all that was lost, unfortunately. Uh, Melies made money with his films. He lost a lot of money. He, uh, in 19, I believe it was 1923, uh, had some sort of a breakdown and destroyed all of his films, destroyed everything, and uh, stepped away from cinema. And what exists today are things that were already out there in the world because his films were so popular, at least some of them were, some of them were huge flops. Uh, but these were people who were, who preserved this either accidentally or deliberately until they've been documented today, archived uh, and restored. And now we can watch, I believe, around 200 of his films out of 500, out of more than 500 that he filmed in his lifetime, and a lot more than that. Um, apparently he also filmed a lot of documentary scenes which are not credited to him. These are just scenes of, you know, real life. So, a lot of this history contained uh, in this book, a lot of writing of Melies in this book, talking about himself in the third person, uh, I guess because there was nobody to write about him. The story also involves his brother, who also was involved in film. His brother took a camera around the world when, you know, before anybody else really, trying to capture and document other cultures, exaggerating certain cultures because he didn't think they were exotic enough, and uh, just going on these adventures trying to capture. Most of the stuff failed, uh, most of this early video failed, but there were really beautiful things that came out of it which had an impact on cinema, which are, by the way, it's beautiful by itself, but had impact, you know, up until today, some of the most influential and greatest filmmakers who have ever lived have been inspired by Georges Méliès and you know they look at him like this master of film which he was he was he was a pioneer uh, and it's incredible you um you watch so this this image right here which is the cover of his book uh, this is one of the most iconic images in cinema uh, Voyage to the Moon, which was a film that he made, which was lost and rediscovered and restored. Now you can watch it. Uh, incredible story. A lot of these movies were silent. Uh, all these movies were silent, but they weren't meant to be watched silently. They were meant to be watched in groups of people. They were meant to have narration, storytellers narrating them live music to accompany them. Uh, it's one of the saddest parts when you see a lot of these old movies and you know the, they call them silent films. Uh, just like many other art forms they had accompaniment to them and because of that they just felt more special, they just felt more timeless and there was a participatory element of it where you brought that story to life in your own life and for your group and there was something very tribal about it and it was quite inspiring to read this uh, in this book because you know I knew about it I had heard about it but I didn't know people were narrating and it's like what a beautiful idea imagine showing somebody some of old uh, some of these old films by George Melier some of them are a minute long less some of them are you know, a few minutes long, but you sit down and you show it to a kid and you're able to narrate it to them. And they're able to have that experience of seeing this. And, you know, these images, many of them very haunting images, stuff that Im imprints on you and inspires you. Uh, very inspiring stuff. It's really hard to, to really uh, express the impact, but that was, that was a beautiful concept. 
to to me to for uh, for me to learn about that wow you can make these types of art form interactive in a way that uh, it, it involves people it brings them in they become a part of it they can tell that story they can narrate it they can play music to it uh, what a beautiful what a beautiful thing what a beautiful thing um, George Melier, uh, a lot of just great information in this book, uh, great information on the history of, of cinema and uh, George Melier was also a magician. They talked about him performing. He bought uh, Robert Houdin's theater or what they call a theater and uh, turned it into his own theater to uh, to do his productions in. It's crazy. It's crazy this line. You know, there's a line throughout history where these people are going into new directions and they don't know what they're doing. It's costing them all their money. They're losing money. They're bleeding their money out. <laughs> they're losing everything. And um, it's a thankless job. You get these sparks of encouragement. You get these sparks of uh, acclaim. But a lot of it, the work is so hard. They were saying they're shooting outside for hours for a single shot. And so they would set up, you know, what was supposed to be an indoor scene, they're setting it up outside. And uh, they have to, you know, some of these you see, it's supposed to be an indoor scene. You see the wind blowing through it. You see rain maybe pouring into the scene because, you know, they can't control the weather. And they don't want to put a roof over the scene and turn it into like a tent because that means less light is getting in. Uh, just the difficulty that existed and the passion that had to exist to be able to over overcome that is uh, just inspiring. It's an inspiring story. It's a tragic story. Uh, I genuinely uh, would love to sit and speak for hours on George Melier's life and discover it. Uh, and you know, each one of the films. Uh, they're they're very short. Each one of them deserves to be watched, deserves to be talked about, and it's it's an impossible task to really just sit down and do it in a span of a few minutes. But what this book does is it brings some of that to life, and it just it makes you appreciate the work. Like this is somebody's life. And they're putting so much work, they're putting their heart and soul and everything that they have uh, into doing this. And they don't know if it's going to work or not work. And they're making money, losing money. It's a crazy roller coaster, but it's inspiring. And it's like, wow, that, that's sort of what life is supposed to be about. And that's what these guys did. Pioneers going out, exploring, trying new things. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. Georges Melier lost his house, <laughs> you know, like he lost his house. He, uh, one of his backers, uh, you know, for collateral, he wanted to make these movies, said, these movies are going to change the world. The, the backer says, well, that's, you know, that's great, but, you know, we need some collateral in case uh, they're not successful. Georges Melier puts his house uh, as collateral. He makes these four films. All of them are flop. And uh, he loses his house, and it's like that is sort of that spirit of it's like, yeah, you're gonna eat dirt <laughs> and get kicked in the face and lose all your money, uh, and you're gonna lose and lose, uh, and it's and it's gonna be hard on you. The guy uh, eventually had a breakdown, destroyed all his stuff. He had to be taken in, you know. They discovered him in the late 1920s, rediscovered him. Is this guy still alive? They didn't even know he was still alive. Somebody saw him working. He had a little cart uh, outside of, I believe it was uh, Montparnasse, this little train station in Paris, or maybe it's outside of Paris, uh, but it's in France. And somebody recognized him. 
because somebody you know called him Melier, and this filmmaker, film historian, whoever it was, recognized him in the 1920s and said, "Hey, do you have anything to do with George Melier, the the filmmaker?" The guy says. Do I have anything to do with him? I am George Melier. <laughs> you know, imagine you're running like a little shack where you're selling newspapers and toys and, you know, little trinkets to people going on the train. And uh, you're one of the greatest filmmakers who ever lived. You lost everything and you're, you're you know, uh, in this squalid condition being, the, and the people, uh, you know, held a, a party for him and they eventually put him and his family up in housing uh, that filmmakers donated money to so that you know they could provide him with a place to live. They didn't want to see this guy. <laughs> yeah, man, it's crazy because this happens to so many people who are so good at what they do. They didn't want to see this guy who had pushed the art so far uh, end his life like that, which unfor unfortunately happens so much it happens to people in different industries uh but you know they they put him up and his family up and i guess he lived the rest of his life in somewhat uh dignity but you know even if he didn't i don't think it, it i mean it matters but it doesn't matter because you know when you look at that work it's like okay this is the price this is a sacrifice this is a guy who chose to go down that path he did it uh, it's quite interesting because in one of the interviews with a uh, filmmaker, uh, John Spear asked him, you know, what does he think about George Melier? And he doesn't want to really answer because some of the, you know, George Melier's great granddaughters or whatever are still alive and he doesn't want to piss off the family. But, uh, you know, you also have these characters who had to be everything. They had to be everything. They had to literally be the, you know, the science end of it they had to be the business side of it they had to be in charge of directing of producing of distributing they literally had to do everything uh these jack of all trades these guys who just you know decided to do this stuff and they, you know a lot of times they didn't even know what they're doing they had to just learn the hard way and I, there's just something so beautiful when you're when you're reading about those struggles and you can see the result and even if some of the result is uh that don't exist anymore, enough of it does that you can see uh, the beauty. Uh, another important note before we end this, uh, one of the lines in here is, I think it's very important, they talk about why, uh, why some of this work is so powerful, why you can see a CGI movie today and it doesn't do anything to you. You're just like, oh, CGI. You know, I watch, uh, without naming films, uh, you, I see a lot of films today. Great CGI means nothing. Uh, and so this is, uh, I want to read you this. The irony here can often be found in modern discussions of his work and his innovation and in creativity and creatively solving the problems with his limited resources that made him a genius. To this day, you could place one of his films up against any multi-million dollar blockbuster movie and an audience would easily be able to tell you how the latter achieved the visual effect, CGI computers, but when shown a Melier's film and being aware of his technical limitations, his images continue to delight and confound over a hundred years later. And uh, if that is not a metaphor for so much art in this world, I don't know what is, but there is something, when, when you realize uh, the difficulty, there is a beauty in the limitations in somebody's work and there's a beauty in realizing how did they put this together and you're not trying to, it's not a puzzle, you know, you're not trying to figure it out that way, but you appreciate that work, you appreciate that uh, passion. Whereas with a uh, CGI film, you know, that took a lot of work to get to that point where, you know, we now have CGI and they can just bump up, boom, 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 create armies and, you know, flying men and, you know, giant uh, animals flying through the screen in 3D. Uh, but when you see what they were working with and what they achieved, 
and accomplished. It's charming. You know, it's interactive. It's, um, I, I don't want to say cute. Cute isn't the right word, but it's, um, there's a charm to it. There's a charm that is beautiful and that you want, it, it imprints on you. Uh, I, I don't know how to describe it, but there's there's a few things in art that can imprint on you. And when they do, it's a beautiful thing because you get to carry th those things with, with you for the rest of your life. Uh, so definitely uh, go back, uh, read reread what I just said, that line from the book, because I really think that is the key to making so much of so much, so much of so much uh, stronger and resonate with people, just that humanity. Uh, people can feel the humanity through your work, through the work that you're doing, through the, you know, the actual labor. They call it a labor of love. Uh, when they can sense that, it's just like, wow. And it's delightful. It, it is delightful. It's not the wrong word. It's delightful. It's charming. <laughs> It's, you know, George Melier. Uh, again, uh, you can find this book. Uh, they made a Kickstarter for it, but you can find it, uh, I, I think, if you go to the guy's website, either go to georgemelier.co.uk uh, or you can go to John Spira, uh, dot, uh, dot co dot uk and you can check out this book. Uh, also, if you haven't, Spend some time to watch George Melier's films. Uh, a few of them are just a must watch uh, for anybody, especially if you're involved in magic. You don't know George Melier, you, you really gotta check it out because it, it will inspire you. I don't know what it's gonna do for you, but it's gonna inspire you because they're really beautiful images and they deserve to be shared. Even with people who are not into magic, even if, if people who are not into film, um, it's it's these are beautiful things check out uh voyage to the moon film that george melier made which is beautifully restored it's part of the uh george melier wizard of the cinema uh dvd box set they also have it on blu-ray you might be able to find it also uh I, I it might just be on a box set i don't know definitely worth checking out hours and hours of great film and this is a great book uh I didn't know that George Melier even wrote, to be honest. I didn't know he wrote anything. Uh, and I, I got to give it to, um, to John Spira because he, you know, he found this writing in French. He, he not only searched out uh, the best version of it, uh, he then had it translated, professionally translated, so that it could be read in English. Otherwise, it would be inaccessible to most people as most people even in film don't do not speak French a lot of good films out of France but not all film is from France so uh, thank you to John and uh, hopefully he makes other projects like this on Kickstarter because this was a really cool one I was really excited and uh, thanks to some of my friends who are into film and magic for letting me uh, know about it. It's really quite a journey. It's just, you know, so many charming things that I, I, I won't even mention, but a lot of charm in the book to read about Robert Houdin and David Devant and, you know, you, you're reading these movies, you're reading about these movies he's made and you're like, oh, I know who this is, this magician, this magician, this thing that's going on in society. It's a, it's very cool, very great uh, idea to make this, the book, the quality of the book is also uh, very good. So uh, do yourself a favor, check it out. I would highly recommend it. 